from 1 Samuel chapter 17 from verse 55. 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 55 onwards. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, Inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the rope that was on him and gave it to David, his armour, his sword, his bow, his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. This was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistines, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Saul was really angry, and this uh, this saying displeased him. He said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand and he hurled the spear for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand And he went out and came in before the people. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. Verse 17. Then Saul said to David, Here is my elder daughter Mirab. I will give her to you for a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistine be against him. And David said to Saul, who am I? Who are my relatives, my father's clan in Israel, that I should be the son-in-law to the king? But at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, she was given instead to Adriel, the Mahalathite, for a wife. Now Saul's daughter, Michal, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Saul thought, let me give her to him, that she may be a snare for him, and that the hand of the Philistine may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, you shall be my son-in-law. And Saul commanded his servants, speak to David in private and say, behold, the king has delight in you, and all his servants love you. Now then become the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spoke those words in the ears of David. And David said, Does this seem a little does this seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law, since I'm a poor man and have no reputation? And the servants of Saul told him, Thus and so did David speak. Then Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desires no bright prize except a thousand foreskins of the Philistines, that he, may be, that he may be avenged of the king's enemies. Now Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And when his servant told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. Before the time had expired, David arose and went along with his men and killed 200 of the Philistines. 
David brought their foreskins, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him his daughter, Michal, for a wife. But when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistine came out to battle, and as often as they came out, David had more success than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed. Church, these are the true words of the living God. Thanks, Pat. Good morning, everyone. My name's Chen. I'm one of the elders here at RHC. Good morning. Yes, I got a response. All right. Um, let me open us up with a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks for this morning, knowing, Lord, it is a day that you have made. And so I pray, Lord, that in knowing this truth, you would help us rejoice and be glad in it. Looking to you, our King, the ruler of our lives, and knowing that in you we find love and grace. We give you thanks, Lord Jesus, and we pray this in your most precious name. Amen. Charlie Munger um, is a business partner and a billionaire, and he's a business partner to Warren Buffett, one of the richest people on earth. In a recent interview, Charlie Munger said this, the world is not driven by greed. It's driven by envy. It's built into the nature of things. I can't change the fact that a lot of people are very unhappy and feel abused after everything's improved by 600% because there's still somebody who has more. Now to this you might say, well look, it's, it's easy to say this when you're a billionaire. But there's a truth to Charlie's words. Because all of us, to some measure, have experienced and are driven by envy. We see it all around us. We experience it in our relationships with our colleagues, our family, our friends. And we see it throughout Scripture, beginning in the garden with Adam and Eve towards God, with um, Cain and Abel, with Joseph and his brothers, with Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, his siblings. We see it with Daniel and the satraps. We see it with Saul and David. We see it with the Pharisees and Jesus. And we even see it with Satan and with God. Where sin is, envy is often not too far away. Thomas Merton, speaking of this, said, We are born with this endemic sin. We drink it in with our mother's milk. Envy is part of our human condition. But what exactly is envy? Simply put, envy is a resentment towards others for what they have, but what we lack. But to leave envy there, it doesn't get to the heart of the matter. Because ultimately what sits behind envy is a resentment towards God, an unbelief in His love and His provision. And so we respond by loving God less and loving ourselves more. And by doing so, getting what we think we rightfully deserve, but in so doing, leading ourselves to envy and to destruction. And we see this in our text today. Now, for those of you that are new, um, we've been preaching through the book of 1 Samuel. And we've been doing this since late, late last year. And last year, we would have heard that God rejected Saul as king. And consequently, God anointed David as the next king of Israel. Now, coming to our text this week... Um, we would have also just come on the back of the account of David and Goliath. Now, at this point, Saul, at least in title, at least in function, is still king. But here is where the wheels begin to come on loose. 
David, having slayed Goliath, did what Israel's king should have done. And yet, what Saul did not. And so as 1 Samuel progresses, we see David increasingly portrayed as Israel's rightful king, God's anointed king. Saul, however, portrayed as a madman. Someone who is consumed by a love for himself and has no love for God. And therefore, in envy, seeks to destroy David, but ends up destroying himself. I've got two points for us today. Point number one, loving ourselves more than God leads to envy and destruction. Point number two, loving God more than ourselves leads to life and contentment. If you have your Bibles with me, um, you can turn with me to 1 Samuel 17, the end of that. Um, I'll be keeping quite a close track to the text. So keep your finger on 1 Samuel 17 through to 18. I might refer here and there before and after the text as well. And what we see um, in our text or at least just prior to in 1 Samuel 16, is that God tore the kingdom away from Saul. And why did he do this? It's because Saul loved the praises of man more than he loved God. But coming to our text this week, we see Saul still functioning and acting as a king. People are still calling him king. He's still bossing people around. He's still getting people to fight his battles. Now, what's going on here? What's going on, friends, is that Saul is willfully, willfully disobeying God. Now, you might think, wait, hang on here. Saul doesn't necessarily know that David is going to be the next king. That's true. Saul, David's anointing wasn't made public. That's also true. But Saul already knows that his time as king is up. God told him, God told him that from this day, I have stripped away, I've torn away your kingdom. His time's done. And yet, in willful disobedience to God, he still acts like king, still functions as king. And so what obedience would have looked like is to be on the lookout, to be actively seeking out God's next anointed king so he can pass the throne on to him. Now coming to verse 55 to 58, we see this odd dialogue um, with David and Abner. Um, Sorry, with Saul and Abner. Saul trying to figure out who Abner is. And it's odd because it's very unlikely that Saul didn't know who David was. Why? Because David served in his court, served him faithfully. He was his armor bearer akin to like a modern day bodyguard. And he served him playing liars to, to attend to his troubled soul. And yet, this inquiry kind of highlights to us that actually what Saul's doing here is he's now beginning to become suspicious of David, as if he's doing a double take. Having seen David slay Goliath, Saul's wondering, is this the guy? Is this the guy that is going to take my kingdom away from me? And he does this not so that he can obediently hand over the kingship to Saul, but so that he can find him and that he can kill him. You see, Saul, consumed by love for himself, has no qualms killing God's king or God's anointed king because he's disregarded God's word. And instead, consumed by a love for self, Saul would do everything, everything he can to keep himself as king. Now, a question for us to consider. How do we respond when things in life don't go our way? When we don't get that job, that house, or when our health fails us, do we take it as a sign that God doesn't love us? Do we then take matters into our own hands, even if it means disregarding and disobeying God's word? I know for many of us, myself included, we have done and and, and thought as such. But friends, the cross reminds us that God loves us. 
And that even in our longings, even in our desires, even in our distress, He has not forsaken us, but He is with us. And so the solution isn't to turn away from God, but it's to turn towards Him. Because the more we turn to ourselves, the more it will lead us to envy and to destruction. To see this play out, we can turn to our text in verses 6 to 9. And here we receive that Israel, they they receive a, a welcome home parade. And they've got good news to celebrate. God having delivered Israel from the Philistines. But whatever joy Saul had at the beginning of the parade was very quickly quashed. As the women come out singing, Saul has struck down thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And this saying, friends, made Saul very angry. It displeased him. Saul thinking, they've ascribed to David tens of thousands. But they've only ascribed to me thousands. You can imagine Saul thinking, what's going on here? But when you look into it, Saul disregards the fact that people ascribed to him thousands. They revered him already as a hero of war. But consumed by a love for himself, Saul can't hear it. He can't hear it. Now, we might empathize with Saul's reaction. I know I do. Honestly, I do. But when you look into it, did Saul fight Goliath? No. No. David did. And the only reason why Saul can be welcomed home alive in that parade is because David fought his battle for him. Saul should be thankful for David. And yet in envy, he, he can't be thankful. But instead... In his hearts of hearts, he says, what more can David have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. Now look, we've all eyed someone in our lives before, I'm sure. Not in love, but in envy. I know I have. And that very person, their very existence often threatens our own. And the funny thing is, this person or these people are often someone close to us. Someone that we can relate to. Bertrand Russell famously said that beggars do not envy millionaires. Though, of course, they will envy other beggars who are more successful. We are most envious of those who are like us, but better. A colleague who gets that promotion before we do. A friend who studies less and yet time and time again gets better grades than us. Or that younger sibling, perhaps, who despite, yes, being younger, got married or had kids before we did. Now, why is this? Why do we feel envy the most strongly when it's someone that we can relate to, someone that is like us? Because when we have disregarded or when we have doubted God's love towards us, we experience and feel love by how we measure ourselves against others. And so when someone like us, but better, comes on the scene, our very existence, our value, and our worth is threatened. And we feel the need to respond. And we see this with Saul. See, Saul had the title of king. Yes, he did. But the people, they loved David. They loved him. His own son, his daughter, his servants, all of Judah and Israel, they loved David. And they had good reason to. Why? Because David was successful in whatever he put his hands to. But why was he successful? Our text tells us it's because God was with him. And there's a real irony in this because the very same God that is with David is the very same God 
that Saul disregarded and had no love for. Now, it might be helpful to know at this point that, actually, in, earlier in our text, that Saul, he too loved David greatly. Our text tells us this. Saul loved David greatly. David had found favor in Saul's sight. He trusted David with his life, making him his armor bearer. And he trusted David with his well-being, inviting him to his court to tend to him when he was spiritually troubled. And David likely thought of Saul as a friend, someone whose trust and respect that he had earned, someone who thought of him as family. And this is probably even the case even after Saul hurled the spear at David, not once, but twice. Now, I say this because surrounding that incident, if you look through our text today in chapter 18, surrounding that incident, Saul had made David to be in charge of a man of war, commander over thousands, given his daughter in marriage, declared him to him that he would be his son-in-law, and he even said that he delighted in him. And so I can imagine David thinking, even after Saul threw that spear, that this is a sign of my friend who is troubled, a sign of a tormented soul, not someone that is trying to flat out kill him. But friends, we all know now that Saul's envy of David led his affections for David to change. No longer did Saul love David. He wanted to destroy him. David had earned the right to be Saul's son-in-law. David had served him so faithfully. And so seeing how this played out is sad. But it's not just sad, it also reflects the wickedness of Saul's intentions. Because yes, David again had earned the right to marry Saul's daughter because he had slayed Goliath. That's what our text today is referring to. And yet, what does Saul do? He reneges on this promise. He doesn't fulfill it. But what he does instead is he uses it. He uses it to plot David's death. And he does his friends, in the most wicked of ways. How? Firstly, he uses the enemies of the Israelites, God's enemy, the Philistines to execute his plans. But secondly, something which no father should ever do, something which is inconceivably horrible, Saul exploits the love of his daughter for David to use it for his own gain. And so what does he do? Saul sets David the seemingly impossible task of killing a 100 Philistines. And this is akin to... um, like a dowry, so to speak. Saul plays it up to say, I want to take vengeance. I want you to take vengeance on God's enemies. But what Saul's really doing is he's saying, or he's hoping for at the least, that the Philistines would do his dirty work. By setting him this impossible task, he's hoping that the Philistines would kill David. So how does David respond? Firstly, he esteems He continues to submit and esteem to Saul as king. And and he also counts himself not even worthy, saying, who am I, who am I to be Saul's son-in-law? Now, this isn't just like, uh, this is like, isn't just like Saul kind of pandering, I mean, David pandering after Saul. But I believe this to be David genuinely submitting to the king. And despite the task being impossible, David, he obeys Saul. And not only does he fulfill the task, he exceeds it. Killing not 100, but 200 Philistines. And this only serves to increase David's stature amongst the people. See, what Saul meant for David's evil 
God men for his good. God was with David. Saul knew this, and being an enemy of God was afraid of this. Now, time and time again, as 1 Samuel progresses, we'll see Saul trying to destroy David. Out of envy, he pursues him and tries to destroy him. And yet what we see is that this leads him to fall on his own sword. Saul's envy led to his own destruction. Now we look at Saul's example and, and we might think of it as, a, as extreme, right? Unrelatable to our lives today. But friends, envy can and is a destructive force in our lives. Let me, let, let, let me paint some scenarios. So we might be parents worried that God doesn't care for the future of our children. And so when we look around, we see all these other kids who just seem to be that one step ahead of our own kids. And so lacking assurance of God's love towards us and towards our children, what do we do? We take matters into our own hands. And we pack out our kids' calendars with enrichment upon enrichment, tutor upon tutor. Communicating to them that life can wait till after PSLE. Right? But what does this do? It distorts our children's view of their adolescence and possibly even destroys their relationship with ourselves. Or perhaps we're someone struggling with singleness and every time we turn on Insta, we can't help but see our friends um, getting hitched, finding um, a partner, seeing a reel on um, someone getting engaged or married. And so what do we do? We delete Insta. All right, we just delete it. And we also then begin to spend less time with our coupled friends. But the thought remains, and we think to ourselves, why them, God? And why not me? And so having doubted God's love, we take matters into our own hands. We begin to put ourselves out there more, compromise sexually perhaps. Friends, envy is at work. Destroying our view of self, destroying our body image, and destroying our sexuality. Envy would have us believe that God doesn't love us. And therefore, we should respond by loving Him less and loving ourselves more. And it promises that by doing so, we'll get what we don't yet have but what we rightfully deserve. But friends, this is a false promise because envy doesn't rest until it's tasted destruction, be it ourselves or be it with others. And so, what can we do about envy? Point number two. The first thing to do about envy is to acknowledge that we ourselves can't do anything about it. Now hang with me here. This might seem pretty depressing, but it gets better. See, the thing about envy is that you might ask, if it feels horrible and does horrible, why do we envy? Because the thing is, envy, although it feels horrible, it feels right. It feels right. It is tied up with a sense of justice, getting what we deserve, and it's tied up with a sense of a love for ourselves. If envy could be defined as a question, simply put, it's, why them? And why not me? Why did they get that promotion? Why did they get into that school? Why did they get to have that child? Why didn't I get it? 
Why didn't I deserve it? Why didn't I get my just reward? Now, acknowledging that we can't do anything about our own envy is contrary to what popular thought would have us believe. Now, a well-known public figure and um, a professor at an esteemed Ivy League school would have us believe that there are three ways to deal with envy. Number one, turn off social media. Turn off social media. Number two, find healthy fields of competition. Number three, focus on the ordinary parts of other people's lives. But when you think about it, these three things, they, they, they don't deal with envy. They ignore it. They give license to it in a way that just sounds nicer. Or they redirect it. Because again, what sits behind envy is resentment towards God, an unbelief in his love and his provision. And this resentment and unbelief, they exist because of sin. Envy is something that we have been drinking in. It's the endemic sin that we've drank in from our mother's milk. And so we can't look to fix envy by ourselves. But the good news is, we can look to Christ our King, who can. Last week, you would have heard that A. Kyung preached on Goliath being a representative of Satan, the, the, the serpent, and David a foreshadow pointing forward to the person of Jesus, the serpent crusher. And at this point in our text, David still foreshadows Jesus. Saul, however, he's a representative of an enemy of God. One who tried to kill God's anointed king. And we see this represented in the Pharisees in the New Testament. Now, the Pharisees were the religious rulers of Israel. And although under Roman rule in the New Testament, they still exerted great authority over the people. But this all changed when Jesus entered the scene. And the Pharisees... They felt threatened. See, similar to David, the, the, the people flocked to Jesus. They marveled at his works and his teachings. And yet, the Pharisees, time and time again, they would challenge and be angry towards Jesus, challenging his practices, challenging his teachings. And they would plot to kill Jesus. But like David, Jesus would evade them. And he would succeed in everything he put his hand to. Because more than just, more than David, who was a man that God was with, Jesus is both fully man and yet fully God. But unlike David, when the time would come to fulfill God's will, to fulfill God's word, Jesus would give him himself up to be destroyed by his enemy's envy. Jesus would let the spear of his enemies pierce his hands, his feet, his side. Why? Because this was the only way for us to overcome our envy. Because you see, friends, it was our resentment and our unbelief towards God that pinned Jesus to the cross. And so by looking to the cross, what we see is the judgment for our rebellion, for our sin against God. And yet, according to the love of God, His grace and mercy, in the greatest of exchange, He gives us not judgment, not death, but life 
and contentment and satisfaction with him. Friends, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus, I implore you to. I implore you to. Because you see, when we look at the cross, we see the love that we've all longed for and the death that we deserved. The only way for us to be led out of envy is to respond to the good news of the gospel. To see an example of this, you can look to Jonathan. So if you can turn with me back to earlier in your text, verses 2 to 4. Now Jonathan is the son of Saul, the rightful heir, and he fits the part. So Jonathan, unlike Saul, he fought battles. Earlier in 1 Samuel, we have this account where Jonathan, with only his armor bearer, goes up against an entire Philistine garrison and is victorious. And why was he victorious? Because God ordained it. God was with Jonathan. And so more so than Saul, Jonathan has every reason, every reason to be envious of David. But Jonathan, having seen David slay Goliath, he didn't respond with envy or destruction towards David. He loved him. He loved him. Now this, this isn't a homoerotic love, but this is a selfless love. A love that echoes that of our Savior, Jesus Christ. A covenantal love. A love that is sworn before God, that declares and swears its allegiance and fidelity to the one true King. God's anointed King. And this, friends, is akin to how Jesus calls us to respond to him today. You see, Jonathan wore a robe. And this was his royal robe. A robe that he wore as a prince. And so by stripping himself off the robe and giving it to David, what Jonathan is doing is he is casting aside his claim to the throne. But he is professing in the act that Jesus, that David is a rightful heir. That David is a rightful heir. But to take it further, Jonathan gives him his armor, his sword, his bow, and his belt. Leaving himself vulnerable, leaving his life into the mercy of David's hands. As if to to proclaim through this act that I am trusting my life to you, David. And am I entrusting it under your kingship? And again, friends, this is how Christ calls us to respond to him today. To profess that he, not we, is a king of our lives. And yes, there is a cost as we deny ourselves. And it may feel us vulner- leave us feeling vulnerable and at the mercy of God. But friends, we're not calling upon David to be our king. We're calling upon Jesus, God himself, the king of all kings on whom all nations and authorities will bow under. We're calling on Jesus to fight for us, to protect us, to sustain us. And he won't fail us. How can I be so sure? So just as the soul of Jonathan was knit to David's, so too does God, through the Holy Spirit, knit our souls to Christ. And just as David was successful in everything that he did because God was with him, Jesus says to us, I will be with you. Always. 
even until the end of the ages. And so whilst we may suffer now, through Christ, friends, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so how can we apply this to our everyday? There's three things that we can consider. Firstly, love Jesus and love others. When Jonathan saw that the Israelites were delivered by the Philistines, working through David, he responded by loving David. And so we too can look to Jesus, our deliverer, and respond by loving him and allowing his love to work through us to love others. You see, Jesus delivers us from death in a variety of contexts. No longer is our worth bound to our work, to our relationships, to our family. No longer can our, is our worth found in anything that we can boast of. But our worth, friends, is found in Christ, in whom gives us all things for life and godliness. And so therefore, we can be content in our weakness and even boast in it, that the power of Christ may rest upon us. And this frees us to love others, to be content in our weakness, to, to, to be content what we lack, and yet to rejoice in what others have. And I've seen this. I've seen this at RHC, and I've seen this most beautifully expressed in this church. Couples who have long struggled with fertility or infertility, and yet, and yet have availed themselves to be a father and mother to many. And many who avail themselves to be children to those that struggle with infertility. I've seen this with singleness and, and, and families. People who are single that avail themselves to journey with and spend time with couples and families, to love them, but also to be loved by them. And I've also seen this with the older and the younger generation. I count myself as the older generation. So just <laughs> People who avail themselves to walking with and mentoring and discipling the younger generation, but in return also be encouraged by their youth and their zeal and passion for Jesus. We can be content in our weakness because in the church we can rejoice in what others have. Second, our second point or the second thing that we can do is that trust Jesus is the king of our lives. And we can see this exemplified in praying and trusting in his word confessing that we're not in control of our lives, but that Jesus is. And so when we pray, we pray expectantly, casting all our hopes, our desires, our longings, our fears, and our anxieties upon him, knowing that he cares for us. And knowing that how much more will our Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And yet we can also humbly respond to his leading. Not a resigned acceptance when, when things that we pray for don't seem to come to pass, but to be content, to know that one, he loves us with a love that we can't even fathom, and therefore to submit ourselves to his perfect will and timing, perhaps even looking for ways that maybe our prayers have been answered, but in ways that we didn't expect. And finally, we can wait patiently together. Living life in this world, it's, it's hard. It's hard, right? The world's broken. We're broken. And yet, in the gathering of the church, we experience a foretaste of heaven. We can come in through these doors as weary sinners, not ashamed at our own weakness, but content in it, knowing that we've received in our weakness the grace and the mercy of God. And we can celebrate this together through the communion of the saints. And we can also come into this through these doors and allow the word preached and expounded 
to nourish us, to cleanse us, and to empower us to live our lives now as God has so ordained it. Don't get me wrong. Our church is not perfect. And on this side of the cross, it won't be. However, it is a very God-ordained means by which we receive His grace. And we proclaim with one another and anticipate with one another the return of our King, Jesus. In closing, Charlie Munger was not wrong to say that the world is driven by envy. That is part of our human nature. But to leave it there, thankfully, does not get to the heart of the matter. Why? Because what sits above our envy and what sits above this world is a king of all kings, Jesus, who, by grace through faith, changes our very nature. A nature that is no longer driven by a love for self, leading to envy and destruction, but, an en- but a nature that is driven by him who died and rose for us, that we might find light, life and contentment in him. And so, friends, what's driving you today? If it's not Jesus, will you respond by putting your faith in him? Let me pray. Father, we come this morning before you. Looking to your majesty, your glory, your power and your might. And we confess to you, Lord, that in our unbelief, Lord, we have doubted this. We have doubted your very character. We have doubted that you are the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. And yet, Lord, we thank you that on the cross you displayed not only your power, but your love for us through Jesus Christ, that whilst we were still sinners, Lord, out of love, you brought us into your kingdom. And so I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters today that in our unbelief, that in our envy, Lord, you would help us even then to turn to the cross, to cast all our longings and our desires upon you and to receive it in the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.